So feature engineering is the process of transforming the raw data to improve the accuracy of our models, and it's a key focus of many applications of data science. So feature engineering enables you to uh, capture domain knowledge, the periodicity and relationships, or between features, and we saw this already at the, the sine function example, uh, and likewise to express nonlinear relationships uh, using simple linear models, uh, again, as we saw earlier uh, in that uh, bumpy sine-based sine surface. Now I want to focus on the use of feature engineering to encode non-numeric features, things like text or categorical variables that we'd like to use as features in our, our regression uh, problems. So in many cases, we're going to build models that render predictions from data which is not inherently numerical. For example, if we're building a, a model to predict ratings based on product reviews, uh, we might have as input things like age, which are numerical, but also information like the state the, review is, uh, the reviewer is from, whether or not they purchased the product, and the text that they wrote. Right? So this would be some, some uh, generic table, which is not a matrix. Um, and we'd like to treat that as an input to our, to our model, our, our covariate matrix X. And unfortunately, we cannot directly apply these techniques that we've described so far to data that looks like this. We need to be able to transform these text or categorical features into something we can use directly in the modeling process. So what we really need is a mapping from some domain, in which our, our table lives, our x, to a feature space that is a, a vector space in, in p dimensions. And this is precisely what we've been doing with the feature function phi. One of the most simple things you might do is remove uninformative features. So take, for example, the UID. The UID is probably not a good indicator of how a user might rate a product, right? So it's probably not that informative. So a simple transformation would just be to remove that kind of feature. Now, why would we want to remove a feature? It is a number. Why would we want to remo remove it from a model? Well, in some cases, these distracting features could influence our model adversely. All right, other things like quantitative features like age, um, we might still apply transformations. We already saw this earlier, where we might apply nonlinear transformations. We might take a log transformation of age if we thought that uh, younger ages were more important, but as people got older, it didn't really matter. Um, we might normalize or standardize data. So these kinds of transformations become critically important when we introduce concepts like regularization. Categorical features are a little more tricky. It's things like state. Um, so how should we convert state into a meaningful number? Well. A simple solution might be to assign a number to each state. Alabama's 1, maybe Utah's 50. Uh, this approach has some downsides, right? So it implies an ordering between these states, and that the, you know, as you get to a, a higher state in the alphabet, that's more of a particular value for that state. So we need a better way to encode these, and one of the standard approaches to encode categorical features is something called one-hot encoding. So the idea with one-hot encoding or dummy encoding is to transform our categorical feature into many separate feature columns. So state, New York, Washington, California um, becomes a matrix where we have 50 separate columns. And then in each column, we have a 1 or a 0 indicating whether or not for that particular record, um, the state was that particular state. So on the first record, the state was New York. So every other uh, column here would be 0 except for New York. Um, and Washington, every other column would be 0 except for Washington and so on. So we can think of these as creating a bunch of separate feature functions, one indicator for each of the possible values x could take. And so we'll see this in the notebook. Um, a little bit of a historical uh, context. Um, the the one-hot encoding comes from thinking about a way of encoding a categorical uh, value using wires, uh, and only one of the wires would be hot, um, carrying a signal. Another challenge in feature engineering is dealing with missing values. Suppose you encounter a quantitative field um, where the, the value is encoded as an AND. So let's say it's something like latitude or longitude from our uh, food safety data set, um, and currently stored in a particular latitude longitude value is a, uh, a NAN or a negative 999 or some uh, a, you know, standard encoding for a missing value. Um, we can't directly use that for regression. So we need to replace that with something um, that we could feed into our regression model. So a standard technique might be to substitute that missing value with the mean. So we can now uh, run the regression uh, process on that, uh, with that missing value in place. Now this is a standard approach, um, but it has a, a key downside that when you are placed with the mean, you're actually uh, removing information. So the fact that that value is missing before could be useful signal. Remember in the food safety data set, we were missing latitude and longitude precisely when the restaurant uh, was off the grid. Um, and so the, the absence of the latitude and longitude field was actually an important signal. 
So what I, I suggest is also adding a binary field called missing column name and actually indicating that the value is missing in that field. So maybe set this to one uh, and then substitute the mean in the original latitude and longitude. All right, so now what happens if your missing values are categorical data? This is actually an easier case. So uh, you can add an additional category just encoding the fact that your, uh, you know, the state was not reported, so it was missing. Um, and then we can uh, leverage the fact that perhaps when the states are missing, that's important signal um, for a, a particular uh, prediction task. All right, so we've talked about how to encode categorical data using one-hot encoding techniques. Now let's talk about how to encode text data. And so we encode text data using something like a bag, a bag of words model or an n-gram model. Um, it really should be called encoding, not a model, but uh, often in, in literature you'll see bag of words and n-gram models. Uh, these are basically generalizations of the one-hot encoding. So if I take a sentence like, learning about machine learning is fun, I can rewrite this as a vector where I've essentially counted the number of occurrences of each, uh, kind, each word in my dictionary. So here, aardvark doesn't show up in the sentence, so it's zero. Um, fun shows up once, learning shows up twice, the machine shows up once. Uh, so this is a, a way to rewrite this uh, string of text as a vector that we could feed into a regression model. So encoding text as a long vector of counts presents several issues. First, this is a long vector. It could have millions of entries, or typically hundreds of thousands of entry, entries, so it's very high dimensional, and it's also going to be very sparse, so it'll take up a lot of memory unless we efficiently encode it using some kind of sparse encoding. It also presents some problems as we go to solve the regression problem, because remember, in our orig original re uh, linear regression formulation, we assumed n was much larger than d. Here, the number of dimensions might actually far exceed the number of records we have, and that matrix inversion that we needed to do um, will no longer be uh, invertible. So it won't be a full rank matrix, and so we'll have to use techniques to address that. The other problem with the bag of words encoding is that word order information is lost. Um, so we, we lose things like negation. Uh, in many cases, that's all right. So reading this vector, you kind of get a sense this is about learning and machines being fun or learning machine learning being fun. It, you know, it, it's captured sort of in this count um, what this sentence is about. This doesn't work as well uh, in sentences with words like uh, not that might contradict the, the meaning of the other words in that sentence. Another big challenge is that new and unseen words uh, can crop up at prediction time. So I might see a new word like uh, kafefe, um, and that word's not going to show up in my dictionary. And so I have no way to encode that new, that new word. A standard techni technique might be to drop that word. So when I want to make a prediction about a sentence that contains words that, that don't make sense, aren't spelled correctly, I just ignore those words altogether. Um, I might also count words, um, keep track of, of words that were not in my dictionary, and maybe, um, again, the, the absence of being in the dictionary might be a useful signal in some prediction task. A side note on terminology, a bag is another term for multiset, an unordered collection which may contain multiple instances of each element. Uh, so in this particular example, the word learning shows up twice. So we are counting the presence of the words fun, learning, and machine, and also counting the number of times that learning occurs. One final point, um, often when using these bag of words models, we'll drop things that are uh, not informative. So words like an, uh, the, or, and, um, uh, these are all stop words. Uh, so words that don't contain significant information, and they are typically removed. As a fun aside, when I was a graduate student, I actually made an art piece called The Bag of Words um, that we hung in, in the new uh, Gate Center that, that, uh, on CMU campus. Um, so because we got a new building, we had the opportunity to decorate that building. Um, so this is the Bag of Words art piece that we created. Um, here I have a plastic bag containing a bunch of words. These words were derived from a uh, Nigerian spam email. Um, and on the floor, you can see the stop words, the words that were not uh, included in our, uh, in our Bag of Words. In, as I alluded to earlier, in many cases, the ordering of words does matter. So, for example, the book was not well written, but I did enjoy it, is very different from the book was well written, but I did not enjoy it. So, one of the challenges is capturing the word ordering in a vector model. And this is done using n-gram encodings. So, this is sort of like a bag of sequence of words. So, rather than counting the number of occurrence of individual words, we count the number of occurrence of pairs, triplets, and so on uh, of words. So if I take the sentence here and I've removed all the stop words, then the n-gram encoding of this sentence might be uh, book well, well, written, written, not, and not enjoy. 
And so I count the occurrences of these pairs of words. And by counting pairs of words, I get a, a richer model that captures the sequential dependencies of things like not and enjoy. So this would tell me that this, this sentence was not enjoy. Um, so this is probably a negative review. So as with bag of words, we have a few issues. Uh, in particular, now these vector encodings are going to be very sparse because we have to consider all possible combinations of words. Uh, and there are many, many possible combinations. Furthermore, we might encounter combinations at uh, test time when we go to deploy our model that didn't show up when we were uh, fitting or training our model. And so we'll have to deal with combinations we haven't seen before. So one solution is promised to use something like caching, where we, instead of maintaining a very large sparse vector, we maintain a, a smaller dense vector, and then we hash pairs of words and just increment the count at that hashed location. Um, so we're going to get collisions, but in practice this often provides a reasonable model, a reasonable representation of text. So finally, I want to talk about how feature transformations can capture domain knowledge. So feature functions can capture domain knowledge by introducing additional information from other uh, sources or combining features in new ways. So for example, I might believe that the purchase of a product could depend on whether or not it's winter at the location of the, the customer. Um, so I, I would build a new feature that says uh, you know, 0 or 1, and it's 1 if it's winter, at that time and location. Now, keep in mind that different customers in the southern or northern, northern hemisphere might experience winter at different times of the year, so this could actually be a database lookup. But this feature could be very useful in deciding whether or not that customer might purchase a pair of gloves. We can also encode nonlinear patterns. We've already seen many examples of using sines and cosines, um, but maybe more critically, uh, behaviors or, or, or things I'm trying to predict could follow a diurnal pattern where maybe during the, the middle of the day I expect more stuff than in the evening, and so I might add an additional feature that spikes in the middle of the day. So that if I'm trying to make a prediction about a particular product or a particular action or a particular behavior, um, I could know whether or not it is midday, and that might be more indicative of the behavior than the, the continuous time. So just saying it was 10 o'clock. This will also allow us to express things that are, that are not really linear, that there's a particular spike in the middle of the day, and then other times of the day we would not expect to see something. We could also build uh, multiple spikes. So if something happens more in the morning and the evening, we might want to actually encode a feature that says, is it morning or evening? So in the next video, we'll do a walkthrough of the notebook where we actually apply some of these feature uh, engineering or feature transformation techniques using scikit-learn.